Hello, everyone, and welcome to day five of the Fair Digital Finance Forum. I'd like to welcome everyone that's joining us live today, uh, this morning, this afternoon or evening, wherever you're joining in from, uh, and those that are catching up on demand after the session. Just whilst we're waiting for everyone to join, um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat function, which is at the bottom of your screen. You can let us know who you are, your organization, and where in the world you're joining us from. Then during the session, we'd really like you to put in any comments that you have uh, for our panelists or anything that comes up during the discussion. So please use that chat function throughout the discussion. You can also submit your questions to the panelists uh, using that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Perfect. So I want to start by introducing this session. It's the uh, Next Generation Consumers and Finance of the Future. So this is going to be beginning the final day of this week long forum. We've had 15 amazing sessions throughout the week. We've had four days of activities so far and we still have today, which is three more sessions. We've had incredible conversations which have brought together voices from civil society, businesses and also from governments. And through these discussions, we've really been able to explore how to harness the potential of digital finance for all consumers across the world, really ensuring that consumer protection and empowerment are at the center of future business models and the new re regulation that will be put in place. So we started this week on Monday with the release of our consumer vision for fair digital finance, which puts forward the core pillars of consumer centered digital finance. And then on Monday, we launched the Fair Digital Finance Accelerator. This is a new three-year program which aims to strengthen the voice of underrepresented consumers in digital finance policymaking and product design. And then last but not least, we had on Wednesday the uh, hugely successful release of a global consumer statement on Buy Now, Pay Later which has been endorsed by consumer advocates all across the world. Uh, and Patrick from Choice, who's been uh, leading on this from Australia, has just told us that we've already had over 9,000 signatures uh, on that statement. And so, yes, as I said, we still have another two sessions this afternoon, so please do register for those. Um, but without further ado, I'll introduce our moderator for today's session. So moderating this session will be Sandra Wolacek. Uh, Sandra is the platform curator for the blockchain and digital assets platform at the World Economic Forum. Sandra's work focuses on governance and ESG elements of blockchain technology and digital currencies. And prior to that, uh, Sandra worked at the World Bank in the Treasury, focusing on capital markets and how innovation and blockchain technology can be used to promote development. So Sandra joins us with a wealth of knowledge and experience, and I will pass it over to you, Sandra. Thank you so much, Thea. Thank you for the kind introduction. Very happy to be here for this session. Uh, I'm really excited to have these panelists here today to discuss the next generation of consumers and the fin finance of the future. Um, we're, it's a really interesting time. 70% of young people haven't have online access, but less than 50% of those have access to a basic bank account. So yeah, the young people are digital natives. They have a lot of access to, to the internet, to various financial tools. However, we need to ensure that we're able to keep them safe and keep all the consumers protected. So I'm really excited to have the panelists here today that are gonna discuss the various aspects that have been touched on throughout the week. That includes uh, in inclusivity, safety, data protection and privacy and sustainability for digital finance. And uh, all of these panelists that we have are the next generation leaders. Uh, let me go one by one and introduce them. So we have Vedavadi from uh, uh, MGP in Mumbai, and she focuses on challenges in the medical and pharma sector. We have Patrick Bray, uh, who is from Choice in Australia, and he's focused on consumer finance issues in his work. Um, we have David Shear from uh, 
Euro consumers in Belgium. And he's focused on digital issues and sustainability. And we have Vinash Singh from the Consumer Council of Fiji, who's focused on educating consumers uh, and ensuring that uh, the, the young consumers and, and overall everybody is uh, educated in this area. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll, um, I'll get started on the session. We have a lot of interesting aspects to discuss from these uh, young leaders and understanding how we can harness everything that we know today and bring it towards the future and how all of these uh, next generation leaders can form the policies that are being created today. Uh, for our first question, uh, what do you see as the key challenges for young consumers in the digital finance services? I can begin, uh, anybody can jump in or, or if you wanna go down the line, uh, I'll, I'll let you all. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. It's um, Patrick from the Consumer Group Choice. Um, I think an issue that Australians, young people in Australia really face is, you know, almost every young person has access to a smartphone. Um, almost all banking is now done online. Um, reflecting on the amount of times that, you know, a person in their 20s would go inside a physical bank branch, it would be, you know, once every few years if your grandma gave you a check or there was some form of scam. So, now banking is done so often on your phone um you know at, at the touch of a you know a fingertip you can invest you can get into large amounts of debt with not many checks um and so there's a lot more freedom and innovation in the market but what consumer advocates are really seeing on the ground is there's not a really commensurate increase in consumer protections um one such example uh, which was alluded to is in the buy now pay later space um, we're seeing more and more harms developing in young people because these providers are targeting young people with these small loans um, that stack up. And very often these loans happen in constellations. You know, providers say, you know, they might only have one loan, but what we're seeing more and more is that people have, you know, five, six, seven, eight different buy now pay later debts. And what we've also seen is that, you know, these debts come in constellations for young people and new research coming out of the UK is saying that about 50% of buy now pay later loans are put straight back onto a credit card. Um, so for young people, it's really tricky navigating it. Um, there's all very slick marketing, but there really aren't the same level of protections and it's kind of concerning. Yeah, I might uh, also jump in to, uh, to echo what Patrick has been saying. Um, I think that as you said, uh, Sandra, young people are indeed digitally native and they are very much, uh, pretty much constantly in contact with a smartphone, their laptops, and so they feel very much at ease in, uh, in the digital world. But this also creates a few problems because the fact that they think they're so at ease might also make them, let's say, more, um, more prone to being targeted for, for scams and frauds of all kinds. Uh, this is something that we see in Belgium. Uh, there's a big issue with, uh, with phishing right now and with scamming. We see a massive increase in, uh, in complaints uh, related to this. And a large part comes from younger people because they go on, on like all kinds of, of social media apps, uh, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, where uh, they're actually a prime target for, for, for many fraudsters and scammers. And they're being pushed sometimes through very elaborate schemes, like with deep fakes of, of Belgian celebrities to, to, to buy into shady cryptocurrencies or, or other financial products, pyramid schemes. I even had a friend recently who contacted me for, you know, to ask me to send 400 euros and I would get 8,000 back and, and he seemed to really believe it. Um, but this is a major, major issue and it's, it's everywhere. It comes from all kinds of places. And I think it'll be a big challenge right now in Europe, we're trying to regulate um, big digital players. And I think adding many protections for consumers, young and old, uh, to be more protected by, from these scams will be, uh, will be a major issue. Hi, I would like to add to uh, David's point, expanding on the David's take of uh, protection and phishing and uh, young consumers falling prey to all these kinds of frauds. Uh, I have two concerns, one of which is the data protection itself. 
because since we are still many of the countries uh, the youth are still getting acquainted with the technology and how to use the digital finance and have very little information about it and very little information about the SOPs of how to handle a digital finance uh, tool or a platform uh, that makes them very much vulnerable to all these kinds of frauds and uh, phishing where the misinformation is provided very um, you know very convict with very conviction so that the misinformed or the half informed consumer would obviously uh, go and believe that information about their own um, digital space. So that's one concern. And I think the another concern is what is the cause of this misinformation or the phishing or the data protection issue and awareness. So when we are focused on the digital finance space, so uh, I think the major issue is the clear information that the consumers uh, need to get. And for that, as the next gen leaders, I think we need to promote um, the awareness about the digital finance system, about, the, uh, about how the system works. Let's take a very simple example. If I don't know what details I have to provide and what details are my private details, so this is the cause uh, when I, I become much more vulnerable to whoever asks me for any of the simple details, let's say bank account or um, the most uh, vulnerable detail is your CVV number on the credit card. So that's what happens when I am misinformed or I am half informed and I give access to someone who is just a bit smarter just to make uh, me maybe pay for what I have not bought or for what I have not purchased. So it is very easy to target such people. So uh, the data protection and the privacy and protecting young consumers from phishing and frauds goes hand in hand with informing them and making them aware. So I think that's the matter of concern for me. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I, it's so great to hear those answers. I think that there's a false sense of security that we get as, as the next generation, as these uh, young consumers. And because we're, we're so comfortable with using our, our devices and all of those applications, there, we, we do fall vulnerable to, to those kinds of um, challenges that, that you all described. And um, so one of my favorite things about the panelists here that we have is the diversity of perspectives. Um, we have so many different countries represented here. And um, depending on uh, the country context and the regional context, the way that we approach uh, consumer protection is, is very different. So each of these young leaders in their respective countries will have a different approach and a different way that they need to address the challenges that exist in their region or in their context. And um, so my next question uh, is gonna be on, um, uh, uh, in, in your specific region, when you, you focus on the progress to being made to address those challenges, what are, what are the ways that you you can um, strive to, to improve on those challenges from a regional perspective. I'm also happy to kick off. I think, um, so I'm a, a finance campaigning advocate and a lot of the work that Choice does is to push for fairer finance laws. Um, and it's one of those situations where you often push for a new law and new protections and then suddenly a new industry emerges which is unregulated and and so what we always try and do is push for broad principles-based laws that capture all conduct in financial services and as I mentioned if buy now pay later is a perfect example where that loophole exists in digital finance I think we might come to it later but I think there's areas of cryptocurrency that is shocking by the lack of regulation and lack of consumer protection. So I think, you know, when we cast our eye of advocacy and how we want to help consumers, we, we see, you know, who's getting harmed, are they experiencing vulnerability? 
and you know where are the gaps in the law um and you know as far as we've pushed across the consumer movement in australia and around the world you know financial services providers are incentivized to skirt around the laws and to skip laws so that they can they can maximize their profit motive and so it's always about getting the balance of a competitive environment because competition is good and markets you know are really effective at achieving good outcomes but ensuring that there's good consumer protection so that's the way that we view it and the way that we kind of pursue change and advocacy uh, in Australia. I can uh, continue in the same order as well. Um, yeah, I think we, we also have a similar approach. Uh, we try and in Belgium, we try and look at it from, uh, from three main angles. Also in terms of who we're targeting with our, uh, with our campaigns. And in first instance, we try for safety of financial services, we try to, to reach out to, to the banks and to financial institutions and to all the major players to try and ask them to, for instance, uh, improve their uh, safety procedures. Uh, it's still quite lacking in Belgium compared to uh, other European countries. So what we're pushing for right now is to ask uh, banks to, 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 uh, to increase the use of two-factor authentication procedures and to actually make them obligatory. So right now, the, the victims of phishing, they don't really notice that they've been phished until it's too late. Uh, and that's why, you know, basic security procedures that are being used in many, many places, like two-factor authentication, should also be expanded to, uh, to banking apps, and so that when you make an easy transfer to whatever accounts it is you're transferring to, the app will also send you like a text message or would ask you to open a, an authenticating device just to confirm that you are actually trying to send X amount of money uh, to this person. <clears throat> so this is one part of what we're doing. We're going to the banks and we're asking them to change their practices to uh, better protect consumers. Another part of who we're targeting or uh, another group that we're trying to engage with are, of course, uh, policymakers. And we also ask them, of course, to put these required safety measures uh, into law. And there as well, we've uh, had some success lately uh, with uh, the Belgian parliament, because there we were campaigning to ask them to introduce uh, a new measure in a new law on digital finance. And this measure would actually um, ask banks to verify the transfers that are being made over their networks. For instance, in, in many countries, and I think in the UK, it's already the case, when you make a transfer with your banking app, you need to give in the beneficiary's name as well as the bank account. And then the bank is forced to check before the transfer is being made if the name of the beneficiary actually corresponds to the person or the entity who owns this bank account. This is not the case in Belgium right now. Uh, so you can just make a transfer, put in the wrong name, and it will still arrive, no questions asked. And so this is something that is currently under discussion in Parliament, which we're uh, quite proud of. And then just to finish the third element, of course, we need to, uh, or the third approach is just general increase of awareness and uh, education. So there as well, we need to ensure that schools already teach from a young age uh, basic principles of, of cybersecurity. Uh, and we're also trying, of course, to reach out to consumers by giving them booklets uh, that have been uh, made in accordance with the uh, cybersecurity experts on, on also basic safety measures. Uh, we've also recently partnered up with Google to uh, co-create an online game, which is called Space Shelter. And it's quite fun, actually, and it's made for younger people. Uh, kids mostly and teaches them actually how to make a good password, how to ensure they're not being scanned. And so this kind of gamification uh, awareness initiatives can also be helpful, I think. And and just following on from that um, about scams, what's really interesting that happened today in Australia is um, the competition regulator, the ACCC, have are taking Facebook to court about cryptocurrency scams. It's the first of the its kind in Australia, oh, in the world, sorry, um, where Facebook knowingly promoted scams with famous Australians into cryptocurrency. So it's a really good model for future regulation. Um, and hopefully, you know, that succeeds. It's a pretty strong case that, you know, Facebook have an obligation. They profit off consumers' data that they actually have to um, ensure that consumers are looked after and, and not scammed. Thank you for those examples and for those the regulation that's being developed and those interesting tools used for for educating consumers. Uh, Vedavadi, did you have something to add on that? Yes, sure. Uh, thanks, Sandra. 
Um, so as far as the uh, South Asian region is concerned, even the um, AFI survey, that is the Alliance for Financial Inclusion Survey, in I guess 2021, it said that South Asian countries are still uh, uh, struggling with the inclusion in the digital finance section. So as far as the youth is concerned, we are still getting acquainted, as I said earlier as well. So it is, it is very important to be informed, to be protected. Uh, so before we are informed, we need to be protected by someone other because since I don't know how to protect myself, I have to take help of someone, some regulatory body, some authority or something. So as far as India is concerned, um, sticking to uh, the regulations of the GDPR, that is the Global Data Protection Regulation that has come, I guess, a couple of years ago. So uh, sticking to that, we have already in the process to develop our own country framework or or our own nationwide framework. And also we are part of some um, global organizations. Then the, we co-chair uh, the GPFI, that is Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion, uh, along with the UK and Indonesia who are chairing the GPFI. So uh, on the international scale, India is involving with, um, and uh, we can say, uh, taking help from those who have already formulated their regulations. And as far as the internal uh, national awareness and inclusion is concerned, we are doing efforts to include such topics right from the school education, because that's where uh, a child needs to learn about all the um, financial transactions that you're going to do in future as a consumer. So if it is, uh, it's, it's a very simple um, psychological thing that if it's taught in your childhood, you're ne never going to forget it. So we are including this um, protection, um, you can say regulations or guidelines in our school curriculums nationwide so that automatically just like uh, you know how to dress up and get out of, of the house. Similarly, you know what rules to follow, what guidelines to follow while doing your online transactions. So, uh, and also we are promoting various um, online investing platforms, uh, various, because since we are still evolving uh, in the digital space, we only know how to use some e-wallets. And that is, but, but that is not the whole and sole digital finance sector. So we are still a bit skeptical about uh, the investment part when it comes to investment part or when it comes to actual online banking. Everyone still feels that it's a risk to do, la, you know, greater amount transactions uh, online. So we are still developing the mindset of people that it's safe, it's secure if you are going to be your, um, own regulator. So uh, involving everyone, then promoting digital finance among the youth and among the children is what our focus is right now. So there are various guidelines, various uh, programs have been made to promote uh, digital finance. Thank you, Vera Varia. I mean, having, having kids have that in their curriculum early on and, and being able to, to know the ways uh, to, to remain um, aware and informed from early on is, is really helpful. Um, I see that we have Vinesh uh, here. So Vinesh is joining us from the Consumer Council of uh, Fiji uh, and uh, also bringing a very interesting perspective to our panel. So I'd love to hear uh, in Fiji the challenges and, and the ways that, that you all are addressing those challenges that you're facing today. Uh, thank you, Sandra. Uh, so I'll dive right into it. So some of the challenges uh, which I'll be focusing on, uh, especially are, uh, on issues surrounding financial inclusion in Fiji, as, as well as some of the barriers which young consumers they are, they are facing in accessing uh, digital financial services. Uh, so in Fiji, you know, uh, while uh, there's been you know a lot of uh, transformation in the way consumers transact. 
over the last few years, uh, which is towards DFA, especially exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, there's still a lot of challenges, uh, which actually are uh, rather barriers as well, which uh, prevents or discourages consumers uh, from accessing or using DFS uh, or digital financial services. Uh, while some of the barriers they are unique to Fiji, but uh, rest, but it is uh, also uh, there's also a lot of challenges or barriers which are uh, present in other parts of the world as well. So in in terms of uh, digital financial inclusion, I, I just wanted to focus on two, two things. The first one is the widely dispersed ge uh, geography, uh, geographical areas, because we have over 300 islands uh, dispersed uh, across you know a wide area. Uh, there's a uh, lot of areas or a lot of islands which are isolated from, from the urbanized areas. So here in these areas, the consumers are often left behind in terms of connectivity in the form of the, uh, uh, in terms of connectivity. So these consumers isolation places them as a, at a disadvantage compared to the consumers in other urban areas. So making them unreachable and unbanked. So uh, there's you know, great need for inclusion in this particular area. Uh, another one is uh, the digital financial services. It is uh, relatively new to consumers here. And we saw a huge uptake of DFS platforms uh, such as mobile money uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially because it was used as a platform to disperse the government grants. So all the financial assistance which was delivered by the government was done through DFS, such as mobile money wallets. However, we saw that there were certain segments of consumers, especially the elderly who were not familiar with DFS usage. Hence, they ended up losing considerable portion of their government assistance because simply because of the reason they didn't know how to use it. And because of that, they, were, they faced you know, unfair uh, trading practices as well. So therefore, in regards to financial inclusion, so we can say there are two major issues, ge uh, geography isolated consumers, and uh, certain segments of consumers, maybe the early or the non tech safe consumers who are left behind. So, uh, and uh, some of the barriers which young consumers, I want to share this as well, which face here uh, in small island developing states, uh, include uh, maybe compared to older generations, but uh, uh evidence you know in fiji suggests that they are the also segment of consumer groups we actually easily fall victims to scams uh so cyber security becomes an issue another very major one is interoperability so young consumers because they are uh, very uh, tech savvy they would like to uh, engage in transitions through dfs but uh, because of the lack of interoperability in fiji between different systems that becomes an issue uh for example if I want to use my mobile money wallet, but it is not synced to the systems of banks or other platforms that I'll be directly able to transfer uh, uh, transfer cash uh, from my uh, online ba online banking platform, my bank uh, to mobile money wallet. So this lack of interoperability between different systems that has become a major issue. Uh, thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective. It, it's so interesting to hear how, how everybody's approaching it in, in their various regions and countries. Um, so with that, I think we have a lot of power as young consumers to, to influence change. So how, how, are, how are you all approaching uh, digital finance and using it as a tool for change in, in the future? Um, I'll, I'll maybe start back with Patrick again. Yeah. Um... I've been reflecting on, you know, the power of digital finance. Um, and I was chatting with my 25 year old housemate uh, last night over dinner. Uh, and he was saying he invests in Bitcoin and it takes him all of two minutes to set up an account um, to invest and, you know, all of two minutes to sell. And I think there's been such a massive improvement in innovation in digital finance, like if one were to, to consider trading stocks in the, in, you know, the 1970s, you'd have to get a stockbroker, you'd have to call or email someone or take many days, you know, you know, could even take a week, the fees, there'd be commissions. Now it's all in the, in, in the palm of your hands. Um, and I think that's you know, a testament to innovation, but on the other side of the coin, there are so many harms and dangers um, that we see. So, uh, 
you know, crypto itself and online trading, there's a lot of volatility, there's a lot of scams, there's a lot of risk. There's a whole lot of consumer confusion. If you were to ask a hundred people in the street, you know, how many would actually know the operations of that market? So there's this constant tension for young people where there's innovation and there's change and improvements, but there's also risks and lack of consumer protections. So that's something that, you know, as a consumer group in Australia, we're really thinking about. Um, on a practical example, um, you know, we are now using, you know, different platforms uh, to help people make decisions. Um, it's not exactly digital finance, but one great example that Choice did a few years ago was around free range eggs. So, you know, there's a lot of confusion around whether eggs uh, yeah, free range or not and there's a lot of labeling errors and we developed an app where people could scan the barcode and work out exactly whether the eggs that you were purchasing were from free range eggs and not caged or farmed eggs and there's all these little examples of innovations through apps like that which I think is really powerful um, but there's that constant tension that we're dealing with is improving competition in the market ensuring that there's new products you know new ways to trade and to make money but just to ensure that there are consumer protections and you know I think I'm harking on, but it's just something that we really see as really important. And I think in many respects, like this kind of digital and online trading and the need for young people to kind of invest their money is really some kind of challenge against intergenerational wealth disparity. Um, in, in, in a lot of countries like America, UK, Australia, you know, as a young person, the possibility of owning a house is really difficult, inflation is rising considerably, wages are decreasing. You know, they're seeing, we're all seeing our parents and grandparents' generation sitting on a lot of wealth. And I think the young people, they're, they're kind of, they wanna do something about it and they see these new markets. Oh, why don't I invest in, you know, Ethereum or, you know, what Dogecoin or whatever the new the new fad is. But it's, it's, it's this kind of gra grasping or grappling at, you know, some form of reclaiming this intergenerational inequality. And it's, it's hard to grasp what it is, but I think I, I'm seeing it more and more amongst young people in Australia. That's so interesting. And, and you're bringing in a lot of use cases here. A lot of these are uh, definitely uh, some new innovations and new technologies, but the, the challenges have existed for so long. They're wrapped in a different way. And so con consumers, young consumers, maybe don't realize the challenges that are associated with them, but historically they're, they're falling into the same trap so it, it's good to remain aware and and having you all as as leaders to to maintain that awareness um so I'll, I'll just move on to to david if you could provide your your thoughts yeah um well i'd like to jump jump back to what uh, what patrick was saying he was making a lot of very uh, interesting points um and in terms of like young consumers engaging with uh, digital financial products, I think what was really telling was the whole GameStop saga. Uh, it took place, I think, a bit more than a year ago or last year, where we also saw that a lot of young consumers, it was also related to the fact that many people had gotten uh, these stimulus checks from the American government. Well, they were just, yeah, they jumped on a, on a bandwagon that was also carrying these messages of, 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 of young people being excluded from, from wealth. Uh, and they just well, did something very strange, which was, you know, buy massively this stock from a company that was all but dead. Um, and, and, and I think it's telling, and, and you can also see it here in Belgium, of course, uh, young people are, are investing in cryptocurrencies and, and, and when they make a lot of money, they brag about it. But of course, when they don't, uh, you never see uh, those posts on social media. We have a lot of like posts by Belgian or, or European influencers that you know they 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 step out of a, a big shiny German car and they say, "Ha, ah, you know, uh, do you want to be rich like me? Well, follow my tips and buy into all these weird cryptocurrencies." But you never see the video of the person who lost all his savings or her savings uh, after doing exactly what was told uh, in one of these videos. And so I think it's up to you know us young consumers, but also as consumer organizations, to step into this field of 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 of, of, of social media and other places where uh, these scams or, or these fraudulent advices are being given, and to either engage with influencers who wanna you know make efforts to to to, to fight these scams and these bad practices, but also ourselves you know up our up our awareness. 
uh, increase our, our reach and and really yeah do what we're doing advocate for uh, fairer uh, and safer digital finance so i think that's quite important and just to finish as well um i think patrick touched on something very much broader but there is indeed the issue that young people now uh don't have it easy when they want to buy houses or or, or or try and follow the same life path as their parents did or the, their grandparents did uh, people have to live uh in rental apartments much longer they can save a lot less uh, their money is worth less than it was before um, but that is i think a much broader topic that also needs to be uh, tackled where we as consumer organizations have a role to play but it's it's, it's much 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 larger than that and i'll just add one other thing that's kind of been on my mind a little bit and that's around the role of consumer ed education versus law reform and you know i think education has a really important role to play but in the end, it's easier to change the conduct of 30 big companies than it is to change the minds of, you know, 300 million young people. I think it places too much onus on young people to kind of navigate a really complex system. And the onus should be on companies actually doing the right thing. And I think that's a really important shift. I think education has an you know, important role to play growing up. But fundamentally, when, when products are complex, um, there should be an onus on industry itself rather than consumers facing the burden there because it's just getting increasingly more confusing and more and more young people are getting harmed. Yeah, thank you. I think David brought up a great point that, you know, usually in, in cases where there, there are problems that come up, uh, influencers are not talking about losing all their money. So it's up to the, the consumer advocates to really shine a light on those uh, problems and challenges and, and ensure that people are are aware and educated and, and have that literacy. Um, uh, Vedavadi, did you have something to add on on this point? Yes, um, thanks Sandra. Um, I just wanted to make one uh, important point where um, I think the digital finance sector, a whole of the platform and the system, I think it will help uh, the young consumers to make more informed decisions about their own expenditure. So uh, since I'm a professor, I like to uh, expand on everything in a very simple and uh, example point of view. So let's take a simple example. When I was not in the digital space, let's say, I'm not spending digitally, then when I spend with bills and mm, currency directly uh, in a hard cash, automatically my expenditure is unaccounted many of the times. And automatically I go, um, you can say when it's the end of the month, automatically I'm always broke. But when I come to the digital platform or the digital systems, automatically it keeps a check on how much I spend. I can set to, I can set some limits on my expenditure, not only, um, you know, looking at how much expenditure I'm doing, but uh, actually in a digital setting, I can actually uh, limit my expenditure I can actually uh, put the setting which does not allow me to spend more than what my budget was so it's a very very small thing it's a very small observation but uh, I think this will make the young consumers uh, keep a check on their regular expenditure make informed decisions that do I really have to buy this or not does it really worth it or not and if the whatever product I'm buying, is it really justifying its amount or not? So when we go digital, it automatically creates our own footprints. It automatically creates our own uh, record of the expenditure, which um, might make us think that um, our line of expenditure, whether it's justified or not, then we will automatically go on thinking on every single thing, every single aspect, like really, I do, do I really spend this much for this many products? Is it really necessary? And are the products worth it? So um, what I think is the very small change in our daily habits, but it could lead to a big change. So automatically, it will lead to a responsible consumption. And automatically, it will save, uh, save my money so that I would go with Patrick and David's um, approach on investment. So for investment, I need to have money, right? I cannot go broke at the end of the month. So 
automatically the whole circle of expenditure and savings will fall in line, I think so. Thanks, Sandra. Thank you, Vidavadi. And Vinesh, we'll, we'll go to you before we uh, we go to the Q&A. There are a lot of good questions coming into the uh, chat, so feel free to continue posting those and, and we'll get to them shortly. Vinesh, uh, your final word on, on this last question here. Uh, thank you, Sandra. So uh, yes, I agree with Patrick and David what they share about investment and scams, uh, investment in cryptocurrency as well, because it it also was quite prevalent in the Pacific, including the Fiji as well. So so much so that because uh, Fiji, you know, in DFS was relatively developing Fiji, and we did not have enough policies in place in order to protect consumers. So what happened is that what the central bank did was. Uh, and which is currently being practiced is that investment in any cryptocurrency country in Fiji is illegal. So people can't actually invest in cryptocurrency in Fiji because of the issues surrounding it. So I think it's really, really important. Uh, the main tool here is advocacy, but not advocacy on a con uh, consumer level. So we need to target in three different areas. That is uh, advocacy uh, on, on policy level, industry level, as well as individual level. So because pol policymakers also need to be aware of the issues which are currently existing and what actions we are, uh, we are proposing in order to protect consumers. We also need to advocacy at industry level so that the industry players are there, that is MNOs, they are banks and other service providers. They are also aware of these issues and they are working hand in hand uh, together with consumer advocacy groups and policymakers in order to develop systems to protect consumers as well. And consumers also have a responsibility in this area. So we also need advocacy uh, at individual level as well. That's why we come in as well, uh, so that we can educate consumers on this particular issue so that they can take uh, preemptive measures in order to protect themselves and make good decisions. Because instead of, you know, uh, uh, consumers, if they are educated, if, instead of uh, uh, falling on the bad side of DFS and falling for scams and other issues, they can actually use it as a very convenient platform in order to manage their personal finance, in order to save as and uh, whether he has mentioned as well, it has a lot of advantages in terms of assisting young consumers, especially to manage their money and uh, involving, you know, pers uh, good personal uh, money saving habits. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for answering all these questions. Uh, actually, Vinesh, you lead us perfectly into our first question for the Q&A in the audience. So uh, the question is, with consumer education, do you think consumer advocates need to adjust their approach to suit the younger generation? For example, young consumers will not, spe not follow specific consumer organization accounts to see these efforts. And, and we can just have maybe one or two people answer. Um, uh, Vedavadi, do you have maybe a, a, an answer there? Okay, um, thanks for the question. The question was interesting. Uh, and uh, I think what we are doing today right now is one of the efforts of reaching global youth, I think, because we have a next gen leaders network, we have um, planned to reach out many more people, we are uh, also, um, you know, we are also planning on expanding uh, different ideas to reach out to young consumers so that uh, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, you can say, um, it has reached every single young consumer with maybe by the means of one or the other organization, it does not matter uh, which organization it is. So we could always um, um, maybe you can say shake hands with all the different organizations all over the world, whichever is influential in whichever region, just to because our ultimate aim is to educate people is to is the consumer welfare and awareness. So obviously, uh, going hand in hand with other organizations going hand in hand with um, all the young influencers also we can say, who will promote our ultimate agenda that is the consumer welfare. So I think today's uh, discussion also and the Consumers International Next Gen Network also is one of the efforts, I must say. Thank you so and, much. Yeah, yeah and if you're thinking about individual advocacy and reaching young consumers in an individual country, I think ultimately the key is to uh, engage young consumers where they interact, where they live, 
where they communicate with their friends, where they, you know, talk rubbish. And ultimately that's on social media. Um, and, you know, a lot of younger people now, you know, I'm in my mid to late twenties, everyone's on TikTok now. Like for me, that already seems like a really new technology um, and it's choice has gotten involved in that. So we now have a TikTok account where we post videos uh, about, you know, entertaining things about consumer products, but also really important things about law reforms or assistance. And, you know, I've had to film videos for TikTok, which seems very strange. Um, I even feel too old for it. But I think the key ultimately is like, look where young people are engaging and congregating. Um, because if, you, if it's in, like young people don't read newspapers anymore, you know, it has to be really on your phone. It has to be ultimately in some form of video or some something like that, something funny. Like I think the more creative we get as consumer groups engaging young people, the more impact there will be. So I, I'd consider what medium you use. Those are great examples. I agree. You definitely need to cater to, to who you're talking to in order to, to get the message across. So thank you for those examples. Um, I think uh, we can also ask Vinesh uh, about this as well. What do you think? Uh, thank you, Sandra. Yes, uh, definitely, because uh, for youth, so we have to take a different approach as well. So I would just uh, wanted to share one of the you know, initiatives which uh, we thought here at Consumer Council of Fiji would be beneficial you know, uh, for the question which you have proposed. So what we have done is we have, uh, you know, they, because it is really important to target youth and you know, uh, so that they are digitally literate as well in digital finance. So uh, we have actually proposed to develop a national digital financial literacy program so that it is incorporated into the curriculum, especially at a, you know, uh, uh, lower levels in primary school as well in secondary school so that consumers in uh, or the youths in that particular at that particular age they're educated on these particular issues uh, and they are you know uh, aware of issues existing in dfs and as well as you know how to safely use it so somewhat along those lines so that is something which we are currently working on thank you vinesh uh david i don't want you to feel excluded in case you want to chime in on this this one as well I think already a lot of uh, interesting and relevant points have been made. Um, but yeah, I, I would also say that we need to uh, increase the efforts uh, in, in how we present, let's say, the consumer movement and, and consumer welfare to, to younger people. Because uh, at least in Belgium right now, it's something that, you know, people tend to start and care and think more about when they are more settled down, when they have kids, when they have a house and they start to look at the bills and, and, and start to really look at their budgets. But I think we we have a lot of, of, of reasons to be able to reach out to younger people as well, because the younger you are, the less money you have, generally speaking. So the more important it is to use the little money you have wisely. And so I think there, there are a lot of uh, avenues for, for us to position ourselves and to, to target young consumers. Uh, and maybe also not only uh, looking at mediums, but also looking at, at subjects, at topics. For instance, when we see that uh, there is something happening like GameStop and, and, and a lot of young consumers are in mass uh, buying into, uh, let's say, strange financial products. Well, then it's good for us to be able to jump on those things as well straight away, look at where discussions are happening, either on social media or in traditional media, and straight away provide our view on what's happening and how young people can, can engage with this in a safe way or, or, or can protect themselves from, from the dangers. Those are just a few more thoughts. Thank you so much. Um, so I know throughout the session, we've covered a lot of areas. We've talked about uh, that, that have matched the, the sessions throughout the week. So we've talked about financial inclusion. We've talked about safety, da data protection. And today's sessions are all about sustainability. Uh, so uh, in terms of sustainability and ethical finance, how are young consumers uh, understanding finance and the choices that they make and, and how do they manage their and invest their money uh, related to sustainability and, and uh, ethical investment. Uh, maybe I'll start here with Patrick, if, if you had an answer on that. Yeah, I think that uh, sustainability is a driving factor for young people in Australia. Um, uh, Australia is one of the biggest contributors to climate change and global warming in the world. Um, and the vast majority of young people are repelled by that idea and they want to invest money as ethical. 
um, excuse me if there's a storm in the background in Sydney. I don't know if you can get picked up in the mic, but young people want to invest, um, yeah, in products that are ethical and really put their money where their mouth is. Um, I think sometimes there's issues though, because the definition of what satisfies as ethical money is often very tricky. Um, when you look into it, if you further change, sometimes something which is defined and marketed as ethical, in fact, you know, has fossil fuels at the back of the chain or this, you know, it's really hard to follow that track. So I think there needs to be kind of clear guidelines for consumers around what is ethical investment. Um, and I think there's also issues around sustainability and Bitcoin as well. The amount of energy expended in mining Bitcoin is a big issue. And I think that's going to be more and more prevalent as usage increases. Um, but yeah, it's, it's front of mind. It's a fundamental generational shift where people in their teens and 20s care incredibly deeply in Australia about climate change. And it's the number one issue that people are concerned about. And, you know, young people have been spearheading this revolution. Um, they've, you know, they've been front and centre. It's because their livelihoods and their children's livelihoods will be affected. Thank you so much. You know, definitely uh, great to have young consumers that are focused and in investing in, in, towards sustainable and, and ethical uh, and ethical ways. Um, Vinesh, did you have something to add on this? Uh, actually, uh, Petty just mentioned, you know, what I had in mind uh, <clears throat> towards sustainability and ethical. So just wanted to add one more thing, uh, relate a little bit uh, to it. So I think we also need to be, you know, for, in order for sustainability in DFS, we also need to be trust in it. Uh, that's, I think, one of these issues specific to small island developing states. So if they have trust in it, so that they'll be sustainable in the use of it in terms of uh, protection as well as uh, ethically using it. Uh, that's it, yes, Sandra. Thank you so much. Um, so we had another question here uh, from Felicia. So she said, apart from protection from fraudulent and predatory loans, how can regulators and other stakeholders ensure that young people are not over indebted? Uh, maybe I'll have uh, David start off here to answer this question. Mm -hmm. um... Well, this of course highly depends on the, the, the regulation that is already in place in, in, in the country, <clears throat> excuse me, or the market where you're, uh, where you're present. But I think one of the key things is yeah, to, 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 to ensure that the laws that are being passed force uh, financial institutions, banks, or all the entities that are proposing loans, so even companies as well, to uh, well to comply with a strict set of criteria and those criteria could be reinforced for people who are maybe above 18 but under 25 or under 30 and who might be in a more vulnerable uh, fragile place financially than their uh, let's say older peers so i think that's uh, a key thing um and then yeah i mean uh, for instance, I can speak from my experience. Uh, I just changed banks recently and I switched to the bank that is hailed in Belgium as the one with, uh, with the best app and that has the best uh, digital services. And it's true that it's, it's very slick and it works well. But for instance, I can already um, go, I mean, I can, I can subscribe to 10 different kinds of insurance in like 15 seconds. And there is no single interaction with a human being, with an insurance broker with a banker who would be able to sit me down to actually explain, okay, you're, you're sending this or that. No, here I just click a few buttons. And of course, yeah, then I get like 20 pages of, of the contracts, which I might read a little bit, but so other people might not. And even I just read it like two minutes. And so there's a lot of new, new ways for people to get in that. And I think, yeah, the approach by regulators needs to be holistic to ensure that there's extra protections for young people. Uh, yeah. You bring up a great point as, as we're, we're getting more digitally advanced and, and everything is so much easier, so much quicker, but that brings a lot more risks because easily you can get uh, trapped in, in signing up for all of those insurance uh, that you don't need. So uh, Vedavadi, did you have anything to add on this point? Okay, so I think David made uh, the point actually very much clear. So because he elaborated it so, so well, so I'm... Um, I don't think I might have some many of uh, points or anything. I just think that while thinking about regulations uh, on the uh, stakeholders or um, uh, as a regulator, I think 
um, the regulations should be made a bit separately from what um, you know, um, think keeping in mind the age group that David mentioned, that 18 to 25, which are adults but not adults, which are investors but uh, also earning and struggling and everything. So I think separate regulations should be made for this uh, particular age group and there should be some separate regulations for the other age group, let's say. So which, um, which might be um, a heavy task to do actually for the regulators. But I think this might provide a little bit help for what, um, uh, for what the goal is. So yeah, I think David elaborated it very, very clearly. Thank you, Garavadi. Um, so uh, thank you everybody for answering these questions so thoroughly. We're gonna we're gonna go to one last question where we're kind of gonna do a quick fire method, just what is top of mind for you. Um, so in 30 seconds, what is your main hope for the future of digital financial services for young people? So I'll start off here with Vinesh. Thank you, Sandra. So I believe that you know young people they have the, the actually power to actually transform the way we transact in the future, the way we actually make purchases and trade as well. But uh, uh, we need to do this responsibly. We need to educate our youths as well, so that they are uh, so they are capable of making very informed decisions on digital financial platforms. Thanks so much. Very well. Very well said, um, David. Mm -hmm. Um, my hope is that these new technologies uh, are going to bring, uh, let's say, safe and sustainable opportunities to many people who uh, were excluded from these opportunities before. And I think, I mean, the, the way we, we spend and invest our money is, is, is basically one of the key uh, drivers for change in the world. Uh, as for, 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 for sustainability, to alleviate poverty for many for many good causes, so I hope that uh, all these new technologies will, will will be forces for good, and that young consumers will play a, a big role in that. That's all I'm gonna say. Great, um, Veravadi. Yes. So my hope for the future um, would be uh, all the systems and regulations and everything go from complex to simpler for young consumers to be more involved, more interested, basically as a mindset in the digital finance. Thanks. And we'll just end off with Patrick here. Great. Um, yeah, my hope is that these products improve the well-being of consumers, um, young consumers, and in particular, you know, allow people to live fulfilling debt-free, happy lives, um, that they serve consumers and they don't serve big financial institutions. Thank you all so much. I mean, this is a really hopeful uh, way to end off the conversation. I think that as the next generation, you all are influencing the, the uh, future of consumer protection and the future of digital finance and how it forms going forward. So your hopes are, are definitely hopefully going to be addressed in, in the regulations and in the policies that are, are going forward. I think it's um, uh, really great to have you all as the next generation leaders because you all are here representing on the panel as well as in your consumer advocacy organizations in your own regions and countries. So you're able to influence policy from that angle and influence the policymakers that are making these decisions. So I think this was such an important session to have in order to get the, the views of the, the young consumers and those that are uh, literate and uh, financially literate, and as well as aware of all of these uh, consumer protection angles and able to, to spread the word to their peers, uh, as well as to, to, to the policymakers. So I think we touched on so much during this session. We, we really brought together the, the whole week of sessions focusing on inclusivity, safety, data protection, sustainability, and, and we touched on a lot of the, the topics and news stories that are top of mind. We, we touched on cryptocurrency, buy now, pay later. We, we talked about sustainable finance and uh, uh, data protection. So I really think that we covered a lot during this session and it gives me a lot of hope 
about uh, the next generation because we have these great leaders that that are going to drive this forward. So thank you so much, everybody, for, for joining. And I hope you enjoyed this session as much as I did. Um, this session will be recorded. So you can go back and watch it later or send it over to somebody else that wasn't able to, to watch the session. Uh, and also here are some uh, social media links that you, you can use to, to follow Consumers International and to, to ensure that, that these messages are, are spread across. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you to Patrick, Bedavadi, Banesh, and David. And thank you to the audience that joined us today um, to, to hear about this uh, these important aspects. Thank you, Sandra.